The third Eucharistic prayer currently begins with these familiar words. Father, you are holy indeed, and all creation rightly gives you praise. All life, all holiness comes from you, through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, by the working of the Holy Spirit. From age to age you gather a people to yourself, so that from east to west a perfect offering may be made to the glory of your name. Now let us compare that current version with the new one that will come into use before long. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Notice that in the new version, some changes have been made. Instead of all creation, Isol proposes saying, all you have created. And instead of all life, all holiness comes from you, Isol proposes, you give life to all things and make them holy. In fact, in this section, the Latin has three verbs of which God is the subject. You have created, you give life, and you make holy. Our current version reflects this pattern imperfectly, speaking of all creation, all life, and all holiness, and could be read as if creation, life, and holiness were emanations from God, requiring no initiative or action on God's part. I think the new translation puts God back at the centre, as it were, emphasising more that the Divine Father is the Creator. The action of God, the Father and Creator, is the central theme of this third Eucharistic prayer. We shall say, you never cease to gather a people, rather than from age to age you gather a people in order to emphasize that God's action is unceasing. God does not simply set about gathering a people every now and again. He's doing it all the time. He never ceases. And he's doing it everywhere. The value of replacing from east to west with from the rising of the sun to its setting, which seems to be the only proposed change in the whole mass, that's welcomed by everybody. The value of it is not only that it's a more attractive image, which makes us think of the sun, and a more precise allusion to the text in the first chapter of the prophecy of Malachi, on which it's based, but also that the sun rises and sets at the very edges of the world its orbit, enclosing all human life. God is acting not just here and there, in the east and the west, not just now and then, but always and everywhere. As the prayer has already said, you give life to all things and make them holy. After this initial paragraph, the epiclesis, calling down the action of the Holy Spirit, begins with the word therefore. Because, having spoken of God's universal sanctifying work, we go on to ask him to exercise that work here and now on the bread and wine. We say, in the new version, Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit graciously make holy, these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. Notice that we do not say, 
at whose command we celebrate this Eucharist, that narrows the focus of the prayer to this celebration here and now. But the Latin refers to all the Church's celebrations of the Eucharist. Wherever and whenever they happen, they happen at the command of Christ. After the consecration, currently we say, See the victim whose death has reconciled us to yourself. But the new version asks God the Father to recognize the victim by whose death you willed to reconcile us to yourself. Thus, yet again, the Divine Father is placed at the center. He is represented as the ultimate source of our reconciliation. The initiative is restored to the Father and taken away from the death of the Son to which the earlier translators had mistakenly attributed it. We shall continue with the words, Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body and one Spirit in Christ. That is, we shall no longer ask at this point to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Rather, we shall acknowledge, as the Latin does, that participation in the body and blood of Christ does fill us with the Holy Spirit, recalling the earlier lines, For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. Our prayer is rather that the Spirit given to us in the Eucharist may become fruitful within us. A little later on, we currently pray for the entire people your Son has gained for you. And yet again, this translation changes the subject of the Latin verb. The new version corrects this mistake by saying, the entire people you have gained for your own. Once more, we have here an echo of the opening paragraph of the prayer, which says, you never cease to gather a people to yourself. I should now like to raise a question about the words we are considering, the entire people you have gained for your own. They are an allusion to the second chapter of the first letter of St. Peter. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people. That translation, God's own people, is familiar enough. But in the light of modern research, scholars now prefer to say something like a people he claims for his own. That is to say, God is still gathering his people to himself, as we say at the start of the third Eucharistic prayer. The Church's official Latin translation of the Scriptures has been altered to incorporate this understanding of the first letter of Peter. So in our Eucharistic prayer, if we had a translation like the entire people you make your own, or the entire people you claim for your own, that might be preferable to the entire people you have gained for your own, with its past tense implying that God's gaining his people is now complete. The version that I suggest would both reflect the scriptural text more satisfactorily and fit better into the major theme of the prayer that God's work is ongoing. But the liturgy always bears the scars of its history. I have often thought that the words unite all your children wherever they may be sound slightly comical, as if we were praying for rebellious teenagers who have failed to arrive for Mass. I don't know where he may be. But more seriously, the current translation again misses the theme of universality. The new version is, Gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the earth. By saying gather to yourself, rather than simply unite, this version again reminds us 
that it is the Father who gathers us and gathers us to himself. And by saying throughout the earth rather than wherever they may be, the prayer reminds us that the church is everywhere from the rising of the sun to its setting. Just before the ending of the prayer, we currently say, through Christ our Lord, from whom all good things come. I am astonished that these words have survived in the order of Mass for so long, since they are so plainly erroneous. For a thousand years and more, our Orthodox brethren have been, accused, have been accusing us of seeing two origins or sources of being, in the Father and the Son, and of expressing this error in our version of the Nicene Creed with the word filioque. In fact, we believe, with the Orthodox, that it is God the Father who is the source of all being. And the new version of the prayer expresses this plainly by saying, Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow on the world all that is good. Again, we are taken back to the theme of the opening of the prayer. God the Father, through the Son, with the working of the Holy Spirit, is giving life and holiness to all things. Finally, let me read the doxology, which concludes this and all other Eucharistic prayers. The new form is this. Through him and with him and in him, to you, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, is all honour and glory for ever and ever. Great care was taken over these words, and we were encouraged by officials of the Congregation of Divine Worship to name the divine persons of the Holy Trinity in the same order as the Latin even though that would make for a more difficult syntax than the current version. When we think about the doxology of the Eucharistic prayer, it is helpful to think also about the conclusion to the collects. The conclusion to the collects has also been retranslated, and the proposed version now runs, Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, for ever and ever. Notice that the phrase, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, has been restored to this conclusion to the Collect, and that both here and in the doxology of the Eucharistic prayer, that phrase comes immediately after, mentioning of the, after mention of the Father, reminding us that the Father and the Son are united by the Holy Spirit. At the beginning of the prayer, we had spoken of the work of the Father through the Son and with the Holy Spirit. Now at the end, we turn to the Father and contemplate him in the unity of the Trinity. A modern writer has compared the action of God to the action of the human heart, which sends blood to all parts of the body in the movement known as the diastolic movement and collects it again in the movement known as the systolic movement. Those are the movements that we see reflected in the third Eucharistic prayer. The universe comes from God and returns to God. I hope that the new translation has revealed this and many of the riches of the Roman Missal more clearly. And I hope I have also shown you that a more connected syntax expresses a more connected theology. <laughs>